I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Tensions were high between the Mormon and the non-Mormon settlements in Hancock County, Illinois, of early 1844. We've been discussing this extensively for many episodes because this is an accumulating effect that will continue to more heavily influence our timeline as we edge ever closer to the shootout in Carthage Jail in just a few short months. We should note that it's not just with retrospect that we can see these tensions building, They were felt quite prominently at the time, and some small methods were taken to relieve a little bit of that building pressure. Joe called a meeting of the city council to review some of the ordinances that they had passed, which were causing the citizens of Carthage and Warsaw to be so infuriated by the Mormon overreach of power. This is from the Dan Vogel History of the Church Source and Text Critical Edition, Volume 6, page 233. Quote, Monday, February 12th, 1844, I sat in the city council and recommended the repeal of the ordinances entitled An Extra Ordinance for the Extra Case of Joseph Smith, An Ordinance to Prevent Unlawful Search and Seizure of Persons or Property by Foreign Process in the City of Nauvoo, and An Ordinance Regulating the Currency, and they were repealed accordingly. The memorial to Congress, passed December 21st, 1843, was again read and signed by the councillors, aldermen, mayor, recorder, and marshal. I instructed Councillor Orson Pratt to call all the Illinois representatives together and tell them our sufferings have been such that we must have that document passed, and we will have it. You must go in for it. Go to John Quincy Adams and ask him to call the delegation from other prominent men. Call public meetings in the city of Washington. Take the saloon. Publish the admittance so much per ticket. Invite the members of both houses to come and hear you and roar upon them. You may take all my writings you think anything of and read to them, etc. And you shall prosper in the name of God. Amen. End quote. Now, that memorial to Congress was passed December 21st, 1843. It's quite a remarkable document. Let's read a little bit of it and discuss so we can get an idea for what Joe instructed Orson Pratt to take to these various Illinois representatives to essentially make the case for Mormon exceptionalism that he wanted passed through the state legislature. This is from the History of the Church, volume 6, page 147, back in December 40 of 1843. Quote, To the Honorable Senators and Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled. We, the undersigned members of the City Council of the City of Nauvoo, citizens of Hancock County, Illinois, and exiles from the state of Missouri, being in council assembled unanimously and respectfully for ourselves and in behalf of many thousands of other exiles, memorialize the honorable senators and representatives of our nation upon the subject of the unparalleled persecutions and cruelties inflicted upon us and upon our constituents by the constituted authorities of the state of Missouri, and likewise upon the subject of the present unfortunate circumstances in which we are placed in the land of our exile. As a history of the Missouri outrages has been extensively published, both in this country and in Europe, it is deemed unnecessary to particularize all of the wrongs and grievances inflicted upon us in this memorial. As there is an abundance of well-attested documents to which your honorable body can at any time refer, hence we only embody the following important items for your consideration. Then after that, it goes on to relate a massive history of the Mormons in Missouri, starting with their very first settlement there in 1831, and then culminating in the Missouri-Mormon conflict of 1838. It continues... In vain we had appealed to the constituted authorities of Missouri for protection and redress of our former grievances. In vain we now stretch out our hands and appealed as the citizens of this great republic to the sympathies, to the justice and magnanimity of those in power. In vain we implored again and again at the feet of Governor Boggs, our former persecutor, aid and protection against the ravages and murders now inflicted upon our defenseless and unoffending citizens. The cry of American citizens, already twice driven and deprived of liberty, could not penetrate their adamantine hearts. 
The governor, instead of sending us aid, issued a proclamation for our extermination and banishment. Order out the forces of the state, place them under the command of General Clark, who, to execute these exterminating orders, marched several thousand troops into our settlements in Caldwell County, where, unrestrained by fear of law or justice, and urged on by the highest authority of the state, they laid waste to our fields of corn, shot down our cattle and hogs for sport, burned our dwellings, inhumanely butchered some 18 or 20 defenseless citizens, dragged them from their hiding places, little children, and placing the muzzles of their guns to their heads, shot them with the most horrid oaths and imprecations. An aged hero and patriot of the revolution who served under General Washington while in the act of pleading for quarters was cruelly murdered and hewed in pieces with an old corn cutter. And in addition to all these savage acts of barbarity, they forcibly dragged virtuous and inoffensive females from their dwellings, bound them upon benches used for public worship where they in great numbers ravished them in the most brutal manner. Some 50 or 60 of the citizens were thrust into prisons and dungeons where, bound in chains, they were fed on human flesh, while their families and some 15,000 others were, at the point of a bayonet, forcibly expelled from the state. The legislature, instead of hearing the cries of 15,000 suffering bleeding, unoffending citizens sanctioned and sealed the unconstitutional acts of the governor and his troops by appropriating $200,000 to defray the expenses of exterminating us from the state. No friendly arm was stretched out to protect us. The last ray of hope for redress in that state was now entirely extinguished. We saw no other alternative but to bow down our necks and wear the cruel yoke of oppression and quietly and submissively suffer ourselves to be banished as exiles from our possessions, our property, and our sacred homes, or otherwise see our wives and children coldly butchered and murdered by tyrants in power. Thus, the said Joseph Smith has been tried several times for the same alleged offense, put in jeopardy of life and limb, contrary to the fifth article of the Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, and thus we have been continually harassed and robbed of our money to defray the expenses of these vexatious prosecutions. And what at the present time seems to be still more alarming is the hostility manifested by some of the authorities and citizens of this state. Conventions have been called, inflammatory speeches made, and many unlawful and unconstitutional resolutions adopted to deprive us of our rights, our liberties, and the peaceable enjoyment of our possessions. Under all these afflicting circumstances, we imploringly stretch forth our hands towards the highest councils of our nation, and humbly appeal to the illustrious senators and representatives of a great and free people for redress and protection. Hear, O oh hear, the petitioning voice of many thousands of American citizens, who now groan in exile on Columbia's free soil. Hear, O oh hear, the weeping and bitter lamentations of widows and orphans, whose husbands and fathers have been cruelly martyred in the land where the proud eagle exulting floats. End quote. And believe it or not, that was just the preamble to passing an ordinance. Now, this ordinance stated in section one that Nauvoo was to be treated not as a city or township, but as a territory like Iowa or Oregon was at this time. Section 1 tried to make Nauvoo a sovereign territory, not just a city. Section 2 allowed the mayor of Nauvoo, Joseph Smith, to call upon the president of the United States to, quote, call to his aid a sufficient number of United States forces, end quote, for anything he needed, like repelling mobs or attacking Missouri aggressively or, you know, whatever Joe wanted for that day. Section 3 of this ordinance was the provision which required the federal government to comply with the other sections, and then Section 4 made it so the Nauvoo Legion would fall under the regulations of the United States militia and also receive their pay the way that any other state-sanctioned militia would, meaning from state and federal tax revenue instead of from the Nauvoo City tax revenue. So... That is the ordinance that was reread in this council of February 12, 1844, that Joe wanted passed through the state legislature of Illinois. 
And Joe was making more political power moves after his nomination as candidate for the president of the United States. So this was read and approved of by the High Council in addition to repealing those other acts that they probably assumed were redundant with the ordinance that was passed that we just read in the December of 1843. Three days after that council, an article was published in the Times and Seasons, which is, of course, the Mormon propaganda arm published out of Nauvoo, and it was titled, Who Shall Be Our Next President? Quote, This is an inquiry which to us as a people is a matter of the most paramount importance and requires our most serious, calm, and dispassionate reflection. Dispassionate. I love that word being in here. Executive power, when correctly wielded, is a great blessing to the people of this great commonwealth and forms one of the firmest pillars of our confederation. It watches the interest of the whole community with a fatherly care. It wisely balances the other legislative powers when overheated by party spirit or sectional feeling. It watches with jealous care our interests and commerce with foreign nations and gives tone and efficacy to legislative enactment. The president stands at the head of these United States and is the mouthpiece of this vast republic. If he be a man of enlightened mind and a capacious soul, if he is a virtuous man, a statesman, a patriot, and a man of unflinching integrity, if he possess the same spirit that fired the souls of our venerable sires who founded this great commonwealth and wishes to promote the universal good of the whole republic, he may indeed be a blessing to community." End quote. So the office of president, sure, it was powerful. However, in this age, approaching the mid-1800s, it was the legislative branch with the real power. You know, Marbury versus Madison and, you know, judicial review, that had only been adjudicated just a few decades prior, and the Supreme Court was finally beginning to come into its own concerning its role and its power in the government. George Washington was a powerful first president, but the office of president was still very much in flux concerning how much power the president really had or if it was more of a ceremonial position. Now, executive orders were almost unheard of and used in only incredibly extenuating circumstances in the 1800s. Andrew Jackson had pioneered issuing executive orders to override the legislative branch, and he had signed just 12 executive orders before he stepped down. The next after him was George Washington with only eight executive orders. It wasn't until Ulysses S. Grant that the first president broke over 100 executive orders, and some of society's most beloved presidents ruled with thousands of executive orders, like with Franklin D. Roosevelt topping the charts at 3,728 in his 12 years. So my point is, a president wasn't a king, and a president has never been a king in American history. The position of president is enticing, but very few presidents are actually the movers and shakers who get politics done, especially in the 19th century. The real power in the 19th century was in the Congress, Senate, and with governors of states, because states had so much greater level of power compared to the federal government at this time. So... Joseph Smith vying for POTUS here was in many ways either ceremonial or a misdirected pursuit of power. Or maybe it was a pursuit of power that was properly directed because getting elected to POTUS would provide a great deal of marketing and legitimacy to Mormonism as a viable national religion with over 10,000 adherents and one third of the federal government power under Joe's control. But regardless of the real intentions driving his campaign, Joe's pursuit of the Oval Office was beginning to gain some steam now and because it was a month underway. Now, pieces like this printed in the Times and Seasons became more frequent throughout 1844. Let's tune back into the piece to see who shall be our next president. Quote, But if he prostrates his high and honorable calling to base and unworthy purposes, if he makes use of the power which the people have placed in his hands for their interest to gratify his ambition for the purpose of self-aggrandizement or pecuniary interest, if he meanly panders with demagogues, loses sight of the interests of the nation and sacrifices the union on the altar of sectional interests or party views, He renders himself unworthy of the dignified trust reposed in him, debases the nation in the eyes of the uncivilized world, and produces misery and confusion at home. When the wicked rule, the people mourn. Now that 
portion of this article could have been printed at just about any time in American history. I mean, I could definitely see something similar being written in uh, media headlines today. But the point is, like, it's all very legitimate. But it's kind of surprising because all of those accusations of self-aggrandizement, gratifying his own ambitions, pandering with demagogues, pecuniary interest, all of those could very easily be pointed to as reasons why Joseph Smith was running for POTUS in the first place. And I suppose just like with all politics, if you call others out for doing what you do, you somehow look like the hero, right? How dare that candidate take millions of dollars from big oil lobbyists when both candidates have actually taken money from the same group? It's it's a tried and true method of running political campaigns. You can't accuse me of this stuff if I already accused you of it. So the next section of the article kind of brings in a personal touch. Quote, there is perhaps no body of people in the United States who are at the present time more interested about the issue of the presidential contest than are the Latter-day Saints. And our situation in regard to the two great political parties is a most novel one. It is a fact well understood that we have suffered great injustice from the state of Missouri, that we have petitioned to the authorities of that state for redress in vain, that we have also memorialized Congress under the late administration and have obtained the heartless reply that Congress has no power to redress your grievances. After having taken all the legal and constitutional steps that we can, we are still groaning under accumulated wrongs. Is there no power to anywhere redress our grievances? Missouri lacks the disposition and Congress lacks both the disposition and power. And thus, 15,000 inhabitants of these United States can with impunity be dispossessed of their property, have their houses burned, their property confiscated, many of their numbers murdered, and the remainder driven from their homes and left to wander as exiles in this boasted land of freedom and equal rights. And after appealing again and again to the legally constituted authorities of our land for redress, we are coolly told by our highest tribunals, we can do nothing for you, end quote. So to summarize here, Joe really got a lot of mileage out of the Missouri Mormon War and the expulsion. You know, that same persecution narrative persists to this day. Two years of suffering and over a century and a half of persecution complex radicalizing members is a fantastic return on investment. We've been over it a few times, but the Mormons had legitimate grievances with the state of Missouri and the state of Missouri had acted improperly in dealing with the Mormon problem. The Mormons had also acted improperly by raising their own militia and aggressively attacking Missouri troops, raiding supply trains and stealing state militia armaments and pillaging non-Mormon towns. Look, nobody was right during the whole conflict of 1838, as is the case with nearly any conflict between two groups of people. But what this really shows is Joe's own personal animus in his bid for the presidency. He wanted Missouri to pay for what he saw as wrongs committed against him and his people, his tribe. It's tribalism. He wanted to be the president to make Missouri pay. He wanted the Green Mountain Boys to join with the Nauvoo Legion to make Missouri pay through blood or gold. It was all personal anger that he held against Missouri, and that animus clearly fueled his presidential campaign. He continues, quote, Hear it, therefore, ye mobbers. Proclaim it to all the scoundrels in the Union. Let a standard be erected around which shall rally all the renegades of the land. Assemble yourselves and rob at pleasure. Murder till you are satiated with blood. Drive men, women, and children from their homes. There is no law to protect them, and Congress has no power to redress their grievances. And the father of the Union, the President, has got not an ear to listen to their complaints. End quote. Now, that little phrase was poisoning the well. We were treated so terribly by the president and by the government. How long until all of you fellow Americans are, treat, are treated similarly, right? Now, now, this is an interesting tension that Joseph Smith was going for in the article, to make people fear the impotence of the government while simultaneously fearing for their own safety because of that impotence sets the reader up to kind of look for what the solution of the rest of the article will propose, right? 
We know that the solution is electing Joe, but he's become so expert at selling that fear before selling the solution. And this is the fear portion of his persuasive techniques. Now that he's invoked the collective trauma the Mormons experienced in Missouri, he's harnessed their fears. He opens the doors for solutions. First, the solutions that the powers that be would have the people choose. Quote, what shall we do under this state of things? In the event of either of the prominent candidates, Van Buren or Clay, obtaining the presidential chair, we should not be placed in any better situation. In speaking of Mr. Clay, his politics are diametrically opposed to ours. He inclines strongly to the old school of Federalists, and as a matter of course would not favor our cause, neither could we conscientiously vote for him. And we have yet a stronger objections to Mr. Van Buren on other grounds. He has sung the old song of Congress. Congress has no power to redress your grievances. But did the matter rest here? It would not be so bad. He was in the presidential chair at the time of our former difficulties. We appealed to him on that occasion, but we appealed in vain, and his sentiments are yet unchanged. End quote. You see, these are the possible solutions, right? Neither Henry Clay nor Martin Van Buren are possible candidates. What are we as Mormons to do this coming election year? What this really illustrates is Joseph Smith's expertise at harnessing fear in these public declarations. But he'd only spoke of the known fears of the Mormons. There was another place that he could yet tap into that was an infinite well of fear, the great unknown fears. Quote, but all these things are intolerable in comparison to what we have yet to state. We have been informed from a respectable source that there is an understanding between Mr. Benton of Missouri and Mr. Van Buren and a conditional compact entered into that if Mr. Benton will use his influence to get Mr. Van Buren elected, that Van Buren, when elected, shall use his executive influence to wipe away the stain from Missouri by a further persecution of the Mormons and wreaking out vengeance on their heads, either by extermination or by some other summary process. We could scarcely credit the statement, and we hope yet for the sake of humanity that the suggestion is false, but we have too good reason to believe that we are correctly informed. End quote. This is a level of persuasion that's almost like Lovecraftian in invoking fear of the unknown. Van Buren is not only a terrible candidate for us Mormons to support because he didn't help us when we were grieved from the Missouri troubles, but a little birdie told us that he, if he is elected, he'll do us even greater harm by another extermination, and he'll cleanse the sullied reputation of Missouri for what they've done to us. You see, human imagination is far more powerful than any physical thing a human might experience. And Joe left to the reader's imagination the greater part of this fear-mongering to give even more weight to how terrible Van Buren was. He continues, quote, If then this is the case, can we conscientiously vote for a man of this description and put the weapons into his hands to cut our throat with? We cannot. And however much we might wish to sustain the Democratic nomination, we cannot. We will not vote for Van Buren. Our interests, our property, our lives, and the lives of our families are too dear to us to be sacrificed at the shrine of party spirit and to gratify party feelings. We have been sold once in the state of Missouri, and our liberties bartered away by political demagogues through executive intrigue, and we wish not to be betrayed again by Benton and Van Buren, end quote. You see, either of these candidates will spell our demise as a people, fellow Mormons. No solution exists except for the one solution that I'm about to provide to you. Quote, under these circumstances, the question again arises, who shall we support? General Joseph Smith, a man of sterling worth and integrity and of enlarged views, a man who has raised himself from the humblest walks in life to stand at the head of a large, intelligent, respectable, and increasing society that has spread not only in this land, but in distant nations, a man whose talents and genius are of an exalted nature and whose experience has rendered him every way adequate to the onerous duty, honorable, 
fearless and energetic, he would administer justice with an impartial hand and magnify and dignify the office of chief magistrate of this land. And we feel assured that there is not a man in the United States more competent for the task. One great reason that we have for pursuing our present course is that at every election, we have been made a political target for the filthy demagogues in the country to shoot their loathsome arrows at. And every story has been put into requisition to blast our fame from the old fabrication of walk on the water down to the murder of ex-governor Boggs. The journals have teemed with this filthy trash. And even men who ought to have more respect for themselves, men contending for the gubernatorial chair, have made use of the terms so degrading, so mean, so humiliating that a Billingsgate fisherwoman would have considered herself disgraced with. We refuse any longer to be thus bedaubed for either party. We tell all such to let their filthy flow in its own legitimate channel, for we are sick of the loathsome smell. And now to answer some of that fake news that's been spread about the Mormons. Gentlemen, we are not going either to murder ex-Governor Boggs nor a Mormon in this state for not giving us his money, nor are we going to walk on the water, nor drown a woman, nor defraud the poor of their property, nor send destroying angels after General Bennett to kill him, nor marry spiritual wives, nor commit any other outrageous act this election to help any party with. You must get some other persons to perform these kind offices for you for the future. We withdraw. End quote. This paragraph was genius in how it was worded. You see, all of those quoted headlines from papers were obviously perceived as fake news and propaganda by the average Mormon, right? And with all of those headlines put together in one paragraph, it strains credulity that any of them might be true because they're all so outlandish by themselves. But what's interesting, though, is that basically all of them were true to some extent. The attempted murder of Lilburn Boggs is most reasonably interpreted as a Mormon retaliation for their extermination from the state. Uh, murdering people for not giving them their money, um, not giving the Mormons their money, th that's a bit simplistic and it wasn't wholly inaccurate. But people who didn't pay tithing when the leadership knew that they had means to pay it, that was basically like owing money to the mafia. In well, you suffer consequences. Walk on water. That's another headline that was invoked there. Now, I'm not sure if that's referring to a specific story or not, but there was some contemporary propaganda which circulated about Joe telling people that he could walk on water and they discovered planks of wood that were constructed just under the surface of the water, which, when removed, allowed the prophet to sink into the river that he promised he'd be able to cross. Now, I spoke to historian Dan Vogel about the story and he considers that folklore. The story isn't entirely impossible, and it could be what this paragraph was referring to specifically with the whole walk and water thing, uh, defrauding the poor of their property. Well, that's literally what Joe had been doing since day one of his church, and he'd also sent Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell, known as the Destroying Angel of Mormonism, to track down John C. Bennett when Bennett fl fled Nauvoo for Carthage and was collecting affidavits from high-ranking members and spiritual wives of the prophet in Nauvoo. So... All that to say, basically everything in that paragraph was cobbled together to reveal how preposterous this propaganda was, how fake the fake news can get, right? But like all of it, almost every word in those headlines was true, which shows just how genius it was for the paragraph to be crafted the way that it was. If somebody reading this, that one paragraph we just read, especially believing Mormons, if they don't believe one of those headlines, they'd subconsciously loop all of those headlines together as the same fake news and wouldn't give any of those rumors or stories any credence. To any non-Mormon reading this, it could sound quite reasonable to understand the case that the article is making, that all of these were just devised by demagogues to gain political capital by making the Mormons their whipping boys. Absolutely genius, that little bit that he did there. Continuing on, quote, Under existing circumstances, we have no other alternative, and if we can accomplish our object well. If not, we shall have the satisfaction of knowing that we have acted conscientiously and have used our best judgment, and if we have to throw away our votes, we had better do so upon a worthy rather than an upon an unworthy individual who might make use of the weapon we put in his hand to destroy us with. Whatever may be the opinions of men in general in regard to Mr. Smith, we know that he need only to be known to be admired. 
and that it is the principles of honor, integrity, patriotism, and philanthropy that has elevated him in the minds of his friends. And the same principles, if seen and known, would beget the esteem and confidence of all the patriotic and virtuous throughout the nation. Whatever, therefore, be the opinions of other men, our course is marked out, and our motto from henceforth will be General Joseph Smith. End quote. You see, when we tease apart each constituent piece of this article, it reveals a level of expert coercion, which Joseph Smith wielded to incredible ends. And he had to be good at these subversive persuasion tactics, or he wouldn't be a good religious leader, right? He proposed what the issue was, told the readers what to fear, told them what they needed to see as the real crux of the issue. He answered accusations frequently levied against the Mormons. Then he left their imaginations to conjure a deeper fear than words could ever describe. And then he told them so the solution to all of these problems, quote, our motto from henceforth will be General Joseph Smith, end quote. What an absolute masterclass of religious and political manipulation tactics. This article in the Times of Seasons was widely circulated, and it made many who were otherwise unaware of Joe's presidential campaign wholly aware that he considered himself a reasonable contender. There was, however, a major chink in the Nauvoo armor that had to be dealt with. If Nauvoo and the Mormons were to put on a good face for the nation to consider Joseph Smith electable as president of the United States, their greatest threat in that contrived facade was the town's nearest Nauvoo who hated the Mormons, the anti-Mormon political party. Now remember, the anti-Mormon political party was formed for the sole purpose of combating the growing political power of the Nauvoo Empire since mid-1840. Thomas Coke Sharp, editor of the Warsaw Signal, was one of the founders of the anti-Mormon party. This wasn't a party formed to oppose Mormonism in general. It was explicitly formed to fight Mormon political power and the overt intermingling of church and state in that little fiefdom on the Mississippi. Warsaw and Carthage were the two hotbed cities of anti-Mormonism. Warsaw was the headquarters of the anti-Mormon political party and where the Warsaw Signal was published by Thomas Coke Sharp. Carthage was the county seat and the location to which fugitives from the Mormon Empire would flee when they felt that their lives were in danger from well, the police force or the Danites or the Nauvoo Legion or whatever the case may be. Carthage was one of the only cities in Hancock County where Mormon leadership couldn't exercise their Nauvoo-based power with impunity. Tensions were constantly rising between the anti-Mormons in Carthage and Warsaw and the Mormons in Nauvoo, with the Daniel Avery being arrested for horse theft and taken to Missouri back in episode 171, to the Milton Cook affair resulting in a brawl between Mormons and Carthaginians in episode 180, the resulting town meetings of the anti-Mormons and the Mormons passing competing resolutions against each other was reaching a fever pitch. Both groups had put forward these competing resolutions and had forwarded those resolutions to Governor Ford of Illinois. The Mormon resolutions basically amounted them to them being able to exercise their sovereign authority with the Nauvoo municipal force and the court system and also opposing any encroachment of any other legal system to further insulate Joseph Smith from arrest and extradition to Missouri, basically trying to form Nauvoo as a sovereign territory the way that they had ensconced in the ordinance that was passed in December of 1843 that we read through. The anti-Mormon resolutions basically amounted to holding themselves in readiness at all times to march at a moment's warning to oppose the Nauvoo Legion to, quote, resist every oppression that may be attempted to be imposed upon us by the authorities of Nauvoo at the point of a bayonet, end quote, and to organize people in the surrounding towns into militias to oppose the expanding Nauvoo Legion. You see, these competing resolutions couldn't exist in the same county in neighboring towns at the same time. And, of course, throughout all of this, we see the Warsaw Signal and the Nauvoo neighbor continuing to exchange blows. After receiving copies of all of these resolutions and reading all of the papers that were published um, in the Nauvoo neighbor and the Warsaw Signal about all of these rising tensions, 
Governor Ford finally decided to step in. Quote, Governor Ford's address to the citizens of Hancock County, Mormons and all. Springfield, January 29th, 1844. Dear Sir, I have received the copy of the proceeding and resolutions of a meeting of the citizens of Hancock County, which you did me the honor to send me. I have observed with regret that occasions have been presented for disturbing the peace of your county, and if I knew what I could legally do to apply for a corrective, I would be very ready to do it. But if you are a lawyer or at all conversant with the law, you will know that I, as a governor, have no right to interfere in your difficulties. As yet... I believe that there has been nothing like war among you, and I hope that all of you will have the good sense to see the necessity of preserving peace. If there is anything wrong in the Nauvoo charters or in the mode of administering them, you will see that nothing short of legislative or judicial power is capable of enforcing a remedy. I myself had the honor of calling the attention of the legislature to this subject at the last session, but a large majority of both political parties in that body either did not see the devil which you complain of, or if they did, they repeatedly refused to correct it. And yet, a call is made upon me to do that which all parties refused to do in the last session. I have also been called upon to take away the arms from the Mormons, to raise the militia, to arrest a supposed fugitive, and in fact to repeal some of the ordinances of the city of Nauvoo. Hancock County is justly famed for its intelligence, and I cannot believe that any of its citizens are so ignorant as not to know that I have no power to do these things. The absurd and preposterous nature of these requests gives some color to the charge that they are made for the political effect only. I hope that this charge is untrue, for, in all candor, it would be more creditable to those concerned to have their errors attributed to ignorance than to a disposition to embroil the country in the horrors of war for the advancement of party ends. But if there should be any truth in the charge, which, God forbid, I affectionately entreat all the good citizens engaged in it to lay aside their designs and yield up their ears to the voice of justice, reason, and humanity— all that I could do at present is to admonish both parties to beware of carrying matters to extremity. Let it come to this. Let a state of war ensue, and I will be compelled to interfere with executive power. In that case also, I wish, in a friendly, affectionate, and candid manner, to tell the citizens of Hancock County, Mormons and all, that my interference will be against those who shall be the first transgressors. I am bound by the laws and constitution to regard you all as citizens of the state possessed of equal rights and privileges and to cherish the rights of one as dearly as the rights of another. I can know no distinction among you except that of assailant and assailed. I hope, dear sir, that you will do me the favor to publish this letter in the papers of your county for the satisfaction of all persons concerned. I am with the highest respect your obedient servant, Thomas Ford. Children! Quit fighting. It's an election season. That's basically what Thomas Ford said. Hey, go ahead. No, go ahead. Break out in war. No, yeah, let's see what happens. No, go ahead. No, yeah, call out the steam militia and we'll see what really happens after that. Okay? Yeah, you really want to do this, guys? Okay. Let's see what happens. All that I'm going to do is side with the assailed, not the assailants. That's what Thomas Ford says. After Ford sent his letter to the Warsaw Signal, the Signal published it, but not without their own commentary, of course. Quote, This document is highly interesting to our citizens as exhibiting the exact position of His Excellency in relation to our Mormon difficulties. The governor here tells us that he can legally do nothing at present in relation to our difficulties. We conceive that he is right. But has there not been a time recently when executive power could have been legally exercised by bringing justice, one who had said it defiants the laws of the state? When Smith was arrested by warrant from the governor and recovered by an armed force, was it not in his power to see that the law be faithfully executed? If not, we conceive that the oath which His Excellency takes, quote, to see that the laws are faithfully executed, end quote, is an empty form and utterly unavailing for the want of power to enforce its provisions. It is said, however, that if Smith was rescued, it was the duty of the officer from whose custody he was taken to raise the posse comitatus to enforce obedience to the laws. We think otherwise. Of what avail would a posse have been when a majority of the citizens of the county organized as a regular military band were arrayed on the side of the prisoner? Could a posse have affected anything? No! 
Why then make it the duty of the officer to raise one? We insist that the conduct of the Mormons in rescuing their prophet was insurrectionary and presented a proper case for executive interference. We do not impugn the motives of His Excellency in refusing to enforce the law by executive power. We believe that he acted from the honest dictates of his judgment, and we have an opinion of our own limitations to his power in the premises, and will not, from motives of delicacy, hesitate to avow it. But, His Excellency, no content with defining his position of powers to the citizens of this county, steps aside to intimate that the anti-Mormons are impelled in the present movements by political motives. By what particular motive is it possible that the anti-Mormons should be actuated? Are they not composed of men of both political parties? Have not the recent anti-Mormon meetings been attended by leading men of both sides, who are cordially united together in opposition of Mormon usurpation, dictation, and tyranny? When politicians are thus found advocating a common cause, what political effect can they hope to accomplish in favor of either the one or the other party? So far from political motives actuating the anti-Mormons, we hold that the only reason why there is not almost perfect unanimity amongst the old citizens in condemnation of the Mormons is because a certain class of individuals are willing to palliate and excuse the conduct of the Mormons for the sake of their political influence. Here, then, is where the imputation of political motives properly belongs. With the remainder of the letter of His Excellency, we have no complaint to make. We therefore let it pass with this remark, that if a state of war should absolutely occur, might not His Excellency find some difficulty in determining who were the aggressors? And if he should not, might not, in this democratic country, the multitude which he should send here to mediate between the belligerents take a different view of the matter? This we merely throw out as a suggestion, and it may pass for what it is worth. End quote. So it's kind of tough to tease out of that article, but the editor of the Warsaw Signal, Thomas Coke Sharp, was making somewhat subtle insinuations about Thomas Ford's political jeopardy with the Mormons. You see, Ford was heavily beholden to the Mormon voting bloc which made him treat any situation with them with kid gloves, especially when Joe was arrested in Dixon in June of 1843. We discussed that back on episodes 144 through 147. And that's kind of what this whole response to Ford's letter by Thomas Sharp is centered around is when Joe was arrested and his boys sprung him from the, uh, the arrest, right? I mean, Joe's own posse of Nauvoo legionnaires arrested the sheriffs who had Joe under their arrest. And then they sorted the whole thing out in the Nauvoo municipal court. You see, Thomas Sharp made a good point that when Joe flaunted the laws during that whole debacle, that was the perfect time for governor Ford to exercise his executive authority. But he just sat on his own hands and Joe got away with everything, which allowed him to successfully challenge his later arrest in the Springfield court a few months later on the basis of double jeopardy. That line in there where Sharp says, quote, we do not impugn the motives of his excellency in refusing to enforce the law by executive power. We believe that he acted from the honest dictates of his judgment, and we have an opinion of our own limitations to his power in the premises, and we will not, from motives of delicacy, hesitate to avow it, end quote. Motives of delicacy don't allow them to say that Governor Ford is co-opted by the Mormon political machine, but that's what was implied. And yet, Nobody was really happy with his performance as governor because of the complexity of this issue and his hands being tied and also Ford's lack of decisiveness and deliberate action when outrages with the Mormons occurred. Thomas Ford wrote about this time in his History of Illinois, published in 1854, and his first-hand observations are quite remarkable, even though they're written through the lens of reflection instead of contemporary writings like everything else that we've read today. So I'm going to let the governor kind of speak for himself when he's remembering this time. Quote, no further demand for the arrest of Joe Smith having been made by Missouri, he became emboldened by success. The Mormons became more arrogant and overbearing. In the winter of 1843-44, to 44, the Common Council passed some further ordinances to protect their leaders from arrest on demand from Missouri. They enacted that no writ issued from any other place other than Nauvoo for the arrest of any person in it should be executed in the city without approval endorsed thereon by the mayor. 
that if any public officer by virtue of any foreign writ should attempt to make an arrest in the city without such approval of his process, he should be subject to imprisonment for life and that the governor of the state should not have the power of pardoning the offender without the consent of the mayor. When these ordinances were published, they created general astonishment. And listeners, we've discussed all of these things, uh, all of these provisions and ordinances that were passed by the incredibly vast, overwhelming power that the Nauvoo Empire was gaining. And now in the December resolution, they were basically trying to get it passed through the, the Illinois state legislature that Nauvoo should be treated as a, as a sovereign territory. That's quite remarkable, right? But like that nobody could serve a writ of arrest in the city of Nauvoo without approval of uh, Nauvoo city officials or endorsed by the mayor himself, Joseph Smith, or if any uh, public officer uh, using a writ that was not issued in Nauvoo attempts to make an arrest in the city, um, that he's subject to imprisonment for life and that the governor of the state doesn't have power of pardoning the offender without the uh, consent of Joseph Smith. All of these things, they're, they're incredible amounts of power that Joseph Smith was just writing into these ordinances and getting them passed unanimously through the city council because they were all Mormon Joseph Smith cronies. Ford continues, many people began to believe in good earnest that the Mormons were about to set up a separate government for themselves in defiance of the laws of the state. Owners of property stolen in other counties made pursuit into Nauvoo and were fined by the Mormon courts for daring to seek their property in the holy city. To one such, I granted a pardon. Several of the Mormons had been convicted of larceny and they never failed in any instance to procure petitions signed by 1,500 or 2,000 of their friends for their pardon. But that which made it more certain that everything else, that the Mormons contemplated a separate government, was that about this time they petitioned Congress to establish a territorial government for them in Nauvoo, as if Congress had any power to establish such a government or any other within the bounds of a state. To crown the whole folly of the Mormons, in the spring of 1844, Joe Smith announced himself as a candidate for the President of the United States. His followers were confident that he would be elected. Two or three thousand missionaries were immediately sent out to preach their religion, an electioneer in favor of their prophet for the presidency. This folly at once covered that people with ridicule in the minds of all sensible men and brought them into conflict with the zealots and bigots of all political parties as the arrogance and extravagance of their religious pretensions had already aroused the opposition of all other denominations in religion, end quote. What's interesting is Thomas Ford wrote this passage that we just read after he had suffered political death with how he had handled the Mormon problem in Illinois, and there were still very few Mormons even left in the state of Illinois. Ford was relatively antagonistic of the whole debacle and uh, towards the Mormons, but he also had the vantage point of being governor and needing to view the issue from all angles of all his constituents. It should be noted, Ford didn't take a hands-off approach to the Mormon issue the way that Lilburn Boggs did in Missouri. Governor Ford, contrary to what Governor Lilburn Boggs did, Governor Ford was actively engaged in letter exchanges and personal meetings with members of both sides of the conflict, and he acted in his best judgment when the situation was impossibly complicated with no real winning scenario for any of the involved parties. If it's any consolation, when Ford's letter and Sharp's commentary were published in the Warsaw Signal, Joseph Smith wrote an op-ed to be published in the Nauvoo Neighbor, which was highly uncharacteristic. You'll see what I mean. Here's the full letter taken from the Vogel History of the Church, Volume 6, pages 241 to 242. Quote, To the editor of The Neighbor, Sir, I wish to say to you, as there seems to be a prospect of peace, that it will be more love-like, God-like, and men-like to say nothing about the Warsaw Signal. If the editor breathes out that old sulfurous blast, let him go and besmear his reputation and the reputation of those that uphold him with soot and dirt. But as for us and all honest men, we will act well our part, for there the honor lies. We will honor the advice of Governor Ford, cultivate peace and friendship with all, mind our own business, and come off with flying colors, respected because in respecting others, we respect ourselves. Respectfully, I am Joseph Smith, end quote. In a rare showing of concession, Joe decided to de-escalate the situation and let the Warsaw signal alone. For now, at least. 
And it seems from the wording of that letter that Joe essentially thought that if he backed away from the conflict, people would see any further aggression in this mix as a result of unwarranted attacks by the anti-Mormons in Carthage and Warsaw. Besides, I mean, at the end of the day, Joseph Smith had bigger fish to fry than a flame war with the Warsaw Signal and the anti-Mormons, right? He was running for president after all. He wasn't wrong, but he wasn't totally right. This concession didn't put all the tensions between the Mormons and the non-Mormon communities to rest by to any actual noticeable degree. It was merely a single statement to the contrary amid a cacophony of escalation and arrogance from Joseph Smith and the Mormon leadership. Ford put it well in his history when he said that Joe Smith became emboldened by success, the Mormons became more arrogant and overbearing. When they overstepped their rights and, according to Sharp and many other media commentators of the day, quote, had set at defiance the laws of the state, end quote, the Mormons were merely enjoying the liberties of every good American citizen. Whenever a person in proper authority attempted to roll back that extension of power and those outrages and challenge the Mormon Empire— it was, quote, unparalleled persecutions and cruelties inflicted upon us by a, and upon our constituents by the constituted authorities, end quote. Right? It's a sense of religious entitlement and religious supremacy and exceptionalism that's held by many religions, not just Mormonism, right? We can see how this plays out in Mormonism as a microcosm of how American religions operate and it's a formula which holds true for all American history. Churches don't have to follow the rules that everybody else does. And it's clear the anti-Mormons in Carthage and Warsaw were just as outraged about Mormonism enjoying religious exemption from laws the way that we are when Mormonism today covers up sex abuse or accrues $100 billion of ill-gotten wealth off the backs of taxpayers and tithe-paying members struggling to feed their families all while never paying taxes or reporting any of that wealth or income to any government agencies. And then they cry religious liberties when we say tax the churches. It's, it's entitlement. It's entitlement of the worst kind. It's not entitlement that people say, you know, we can expect entitlement if we get universal health care like every other industrialized country has. Uh, that's a misappropriation of the term used to smear an aspect of the progressive movement. This is entitlement of the religious exceptionalism flavor, and it's killing our society today. We should be just as furious as the old citizens of Carthage and Warsaw for these outrages, whether they're committed by Joe Smith or Musty Rusty Nelson. That's going to do it for our main segment today. Had a little bit of listener mail to get to today. This one came in from, uh, let's say, Carl. Uh, first name sounds pretty good. Uh, Carl says... I realize you'll not be getting to Joseph Fielding Smith for a very long time, but I would like to suggest a name for him in advance. Now, just to let Carl and everybody know, we're probably not going to be even talking about Joseph Fielding Smith for a decade and a half on the podcast at the pace we're currently going. Uh, it's taken us a year to advance, you know, barely a year in the historical timeline that we're going through right now. And Joseph Fielding Smith doesn't come along until the 1940s. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, Carl goes on to say, today I was listening back to episodes of Radio Free Mormon. Uh, in the episode, it was mentioned that uh, J.F. Smith cut or removed a number of things from church documents that he found troubling. In light of this, I would suggest the name Joseph Smith, <laughs> Joseph Scissorhand Smith. It seems appropriate. And I got to say, right, I haven't thought of any uh, any nicknames for Joseph Fielding Smith, but right now that is definitely a front runner. I have never even, you know, considered it or let it, you know, percolate through my mind. But right now, Joseph Scissorhand Smith sounds pretty good for Joseph Fielding uh, for, you know, cutting out those chunks of, of uh, early Mormon documents. Uh, or was that Joseph F. Smith? Well, we'll just have to uh, have to see when the time becomes appropriate. Uh, Carl goes on to say, is the correct nickname for someone who is uh, never Mormon Nemo, uh, meaning never Mormon or Nomo, not Mormon? Not Mormon would seem to include those who were Mormon, but who left the church. Thanks. Love the podcast. So to respond to the second part of your email, Carl, um, <clears throat> usually people who are never Mormon go with Nevermo. Um, 
former Mormons go with postmo, uh, exmo, for, foreman, uh, a number of different terms. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Mormon, TBM, true believing Mormon or true blue Mormon. There are a few different terms that we all kind of refer to ourselves and each other by. Uh, but I think the term you're looking for is probably nevermo. Uh, but Nemo, uh, you know, it's kind of nice to find a Nemo who listens to the podcast. So, Carl, thank you so much for your email. We have some new patrons to thank as well over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. We have new pledges from Williams, Josh, from friend of the show, Tanner Barker, uh, from Daniel, from Barrett, and from Lawrence Huey. Huey is such a great name. And Lawrence also sent in a personal message as well, which I appreciate it. Um, so that leaves us at a plus 12 bucks from last episode. That is an amazing, amazing showing from our new patrons. Thank you all so much for pledging to support the show over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism, where you get extended, not safe for work editions of every new episode. You also get an extra episode every week, uh, which right now we're reading through Mormonism unveiled. Unfortunately, I didn't get patrons an episode, an extra episode this week because I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but uh, a little bit under the weather and uh, it was really, really bad on Monday when I usually release those. Uh, so you'll be getting two extra episodes next week. But what I did do for you instead this week was I gave patrons an extra reading from a Warsaw Signal article that was not included for the regular listeners in the regular segment of the episode. So if you're a patron supporter, be sure you're subscribed to the patron exclusive RS. SS feed to download the episodes because there's extended editions of every episode, which occasionally include extra readings during the regular feed and also the variety show ramblings at the end of the episode. And uh, at the end of this week's episode, if you're a patron listener, I'm going to talk about hanging out with my family at Thanksgiving. Yay! I don't know if that interests you, but maybe there's some things that you can take away from it uh, if you yourself found yourself hanging out with believing family members. Uh, but anyway, that's going to do it for our episode today. I want to thank everybody who did, uh, you know, stick around and download the episode. For everybody who likes us on, on Facebook or Twitter or your, you know, your social media app of choice, or who rates us on iTunes or on Stitcher or your favorite podcasting app of choice. And for everybody who downloads and listens every week, thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart. And also, yo, before we close it up tonight, last week I mentioned that there's a vulgarity for charity going on in the uh, Cognitive Dissonance and Scathing Atheist podcast. They're doing a collaboration for Vulgarity for Charity. It's a fundraiser that they do for Modest Needs every year. Well, that fundraiser is over and I'm so excited to announce that they made their goal of $100,000. Not only that, they made the goal of 100000 but they also had an anonymous donor match that goal, and they ended up raising a total of just a shy hair over $125,000 that the anonymous donor later agreed to match the full amount of that $125,000. That means that atheist humanists this holiday season raised a quarter of a million dollars for Modest Needs Charity uh, Organization to help people who are struggling at this time of year with you know whatever small bills that just catch people off guard and keeps them uh you know it, that that sends them into the poverty cycle modest needs exists as a safety net there to help people from slipping into that vicious cycle and i just want to say a huge congratulations to Cognitive Dissonance and Scathing Atheist, all five of them, as well as all the other podcasts that help collaborate and raise awareness for the Vulgarity for Charity Drive this year. Just congratulations to everybody and to all of the humanists who raised that money out of the goodness of their hearts and out of wanting to hear roasts of themselves or of loved ones or of people that they hate, like they'll be roasting Boyd K. Packer for me on an upcoming episode of one of those shows. So seriously, huge congratulations to them. Let's look forward to the next year's Vulgarity for Charity. Let's see if we can crack over a quarter of a million dollars. It seems impossible, but wow, what an amazing accomplishment. That is more than double what they were able to raise with last year's Vulgarity for Charity. Just an absolute incredible showing. And it really shows that you don't need religion to be good. The people are inherently good people. You just have to give them, let's just say, an opportunity and a motivation to express that goodness that, that exists in their hearts already. So... Thank you all so much for anybody who did donate as a result of hearing about that on this show. And, of course, thank you all so much for lending me your ear. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast as legal counsel. Music is written and performed by Jason Camo of a aloststateofmind.com and used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC, copyright 2019, all rights reserved.